Hello and welcome to On The Ledge, the podcast that keeps your houseplants perky with the added bonus of banishing existential anguish for a minimum of 30 minutes. It's hot as Hades here in the UK this week and for that reason I'm keeping things to the point this week because my podcast recording studio is stiflingly hot and I can't have the fan on while I'm recording because I'd send myself and probably you to sleep with all that white noise. So I'm sitting here literally with a flannel around my neck, uh, a damp flannel around my neck and a damp flannel around my feet in an attempt to stay cool. There's a mental image for you. Uh, The things I do for you podcast listeners, but don't feel too sorry for me because, you know, this show is just so much fun to make. And in fact, particularly this episode, because I'm dedicating episode 104 to a plant that I have fallen head over heels in love with, the strawberry saxifrage or saxifraga stolonifera. And I'll also be answering a question about the ZZ plant cultivar known as raven. So why am I dedicating a whole show to a single species and one that's far less ubiquitous than other plants I've devoted a whole episode to, such as the spider plant? Well, as I said, there's only one reason and one reason only, and that's because I absolutely love it. So deal, people. I'm going to be talking about the strawberry saxifrage today. And I hope by the end of the episode, I will have convinced you that this is a really great plant. It's one of those species like the rat's tail cactus and and maybe the African violet and possibly the Ming Aurelia that transports me straight back to the late 1970s, early 80s, when I could usually be found wearing a pair of Nike knockoff trainers, brown cords and a pudding bowl haircut. Yes, I basically look like Will Byers out of Stranger Things if you happen to be watching that show. And if I was anywhere where there were house plants, I would just be checking out those plants and making mental, if not literal, notes in my copy of Dr. Hessian's House Plant Expert. And back then, this plant, Saxifraga sarmentosa, as it was known then, it's now been renamed Saxifraga stolonifera. You'd see this plant with its scalloped, purple-backed, hairy leaves spilling over the sides of a pot that was maybe a bit too small on a windowsill, or hanging up, festooned with baby plants trailing from the parent like so many little leafy jellyfish. It also sends up tall flower spikes every summer, which get covered in teeny tiny white flowers like little butterflies. Now, I have seen these described as insignificant, which I think is rather unfair because I think they're rather beautiful. Saxifraga stolonifera, I love the way that rolls off my tongue, has a lot of common names, including strawberry geranium. It's not a geranium, it's a saxifrage. Strawberry begonia, it's it's not a begonia, it's a saxifrage. Creeping Charlie, beefsteak plant and mother of thousands. I think the beefsteak bit comes from the fact that the leaves really are quite chunky and thick and succulent, a bit like a beefsteak begonia. And also the red colour of the underside of the leaves gives it that kind of meaty feel. Both of the specific epithets, that's the second part of the Latin name of this plant, Sarmentosa, as once was, and now Stolonifera, refer to the plant's habit of producing these wire-thin stolons or runners, just like the strawberry plant. And that's where the common name strawberry blah comes from. And on the end of those, or actually along the, along the length of those, sometimes you get new baby plants growing. So once you've got one plant, you'll soon have plenty to share with friends and family. One of the things I love about this plant is the fact that it's part of a relatively unusual subset of house plants. It can survive outside in a sheltered spot in temperate gardens in most parts of the UK. So it might be able to get down to about minus five, although if it's a more exposed and wet spot, it might pass away in a really severe winter here in the UK, but oftentimes it will soldier on through. It's worth noting that there aren't a lot of plants that can be put in the same category in that it can be outside or inside successfully over winter. The only ones I can think of 
are the Aspergistra alatia, of course, or the cast iron plant. And Dr. Hesseon does suggest that you can grow the box plant, Buxus sempervirens, inside as well. On that one, I've never tried it. I can imagine it might work in a drafty entrance hall to a building, but I suspect that box might suffer from a lot of pests if you try to bring it inside long term. But the benefit of growing strawberry saxifrage over growing aspidistra is it's just so much faster growing. You might be waiting months for a new aspidistra leaf to emerge, but the saxifrage keeps pumping out new leaves all the time throughout the growing season. Like the spider plant we talked about in episode 101, you can leave the babies on to create a lovely chandelier effect or let them drape onto the soil until they root. And then once they're really well established, you can then cut away that umbilical cord of to the parent plant of that stolon and make a whole new plant. And it's not surprising, really, I guess, that outside these make fantastic spreading ground cover uh, in a semi shady or shady spot. I wouldn't call it invasive because it's very easy to pull out those baby plants on stolons if they go out of bounds. And you might find that your plant is naturally controlled by slugs and snails, which seem to have a bit of a liking for this plant. As I discovered to my peril when I left my Saxifraga stolonifera kinky purple outside and it got monstered by slugs. Now it's getting devilishly hot in here and even the flannel is starting to... <laughs> suffer in the heat so I'm going to head indoors to my Saxifraga sarmentosa collection I call it a collection it's two plants uh, to discuss how to look after these plants in the house so I will see you in a couple of sweaty moments <laughs> just a sec We've retreated inside to the sunroom, which is thankfully north facing, so it's actually not too bad in here. It's 30 degrees centigrade right now. Don't ask me to convert that to Fahrenheit, but it is hot. However, what we're here to look at is my strawberry saxifrages, but you're over here on an east, let me just work this out, yes, east facing windowsill, which is ideal for these plants in that they're getting lots of light, but they're not being too blasted with a uh, hot sun. And I've got two here, both planted in terracotta pots. They're, these plants like quite a lot of water, and by putting them in a terracotta pot, I can know I can water them really generously during the summer without risking them getting too waterlogged because those terracotta pots are porous and so the water excess water can leave really easily via evaporation and not just through the bottom of the pot so that keeps them in pretty good shape and I've actually had the blind down today with the plants behind them because there's been so much hot sun coming through the roof here that I need to lift up this blind to have a look at them so they are on the windowsill here with um, some calathea and my new Raphidophora cutting. Thank you, Dave Woolmer, for that, uh, which uh, was a swap with a Calathea mosaica. So that worked out really nicely. And my cutting is doing well, Dave, in case you're wondering. But we're here to talk about the Saxifraga sarmentosa slash stolonifera. So I've got these two plants that I absolutely adore. One is the tricolour, the beautiful green, olive green leaves with a white edge that's also tinged pink now that a level of pink varies depending on how much light the plant's getting but the stems the hairs on the stems and this is a very hairy plant are also tinged pink and the underside is bright pink too and it's just such a gorgeous combination of colors and the shape of the leaves is really pleasing as well and if you're a person who's a tactile person you'd like to give a leaf a bit of a stroke then strawberry saxifrage is a wonderful thing to stroke kind of bristly uh, not smooth uh, like uh, a gizneriad but still rather tactile and nice to touch so i've got that plant and i've got a baby of that plant which i've just uh, removed from the soil around the plant because these stolons will go into the soil and make new babies so i've got a plant which is going to uh, a somebody on a houseplant swap group and I'm going to hopefully be making more babies for a waiting list of people for that saxifraga stolonifera tricolor 
I can't remember where I got this plant from. It was a swap, so apologies if it was you. Thank you if it was you. Um, and uh, this is a, a wonderful thing about this plant that, as its common name, Mother of Thousands, suggests it's very easy to spread it around. The other specimen I've got is a Saxifraga stolonifera maroon beauty. Now, I have had a bit of a track record of allowing slugs to munch these things. I did have a uh, another plant, uh, Kinky Purple, which was s slugged in the garden and didn't make it. But I've managed to save my Maroon Beauty in time. I just need to learn to bring these plants inside sooner. And the Maroon Beauty that I've got, it's flowered beautifully and uh, the leaves are darker, darker green than the tricolour, but with this silvery network of veins, which is absolutely gorgeous. And that plant is just recovering from its slugging and doing absolutely fine. So lots of water in the growing season is key. Uh, tail that off into the, the winter time and make sure that the potting mix is quite free draining so that you're not allowing water to sit around the, the roots of the plant. As this plant can live outside in in well down to freezing temperatures not surprisingly it can cope with really quite cold environments indoors so if you've got an unheated room this could do very well here obviously it's 30 degrees in here right now and the plant's doing okay so it obviously can survive at higher temperatures but i am keeping a very close eye out for any insect damage because that's much more likely to happen at these high temperatures when the plant is no doubt a little bit stressed and that's why I'm keeping the blind down just to stop it getting too much light as well because it is very, very bright at the minute. Watering, uh, we've talked about feeding. Really, it just needs the usual kind of weekly, weekly feed during the summer. So uh, time duration once a week is fine, but provided that you're doing a weak solution of feed, uh, half strength perhaps would be absolutely fine throughout the growing season. And that seems to be doing my plants very, very well. And these stolons, what's fascinating about them is that there are these points on the stolons, and I'm, I think they're called scales, where the stolons can actually split off and make different divisions and branch off and make several plants from one stolon, which makes them extra productive, which is great. And sometimes, as happened to me, you don't realise that a stolon has actually made a baby and you'll lift up some leaves and you'll find there's a baby plant underneath where you least expected it so it's just a really really rewarding and lovely plant and i'm so glad to have them in my collection and i really want to extend my collection to get as many of these cultivars as possible so i'm going to head back to the studio now to talk about some of the other cultivars available in the saxifraga stolonifera world okay i'm bracing myself for the heat i'm just gonna put the blind down flannel back on the neck and back to the studio. We'll be back to talk cultivars shortly, but first let's hear from this week's sponsor. This week's On The Ledge is supported by Ecofective, a company that's passionate about helping you raise beautiful plants with products that have minimal impact on the environment. Ecofective's houseplant products work brilliantly to keep your leafy charges in great shape, but they're also safe for use around children, pets and bees. I've been using their Houseplant Boost Fertiliser for over a year now and I love how convenient it is. No fiddling around working out how much you need to put in your watering can, just pour direct onto the soil. It's 100% natural and organic and you can use it on most houseplants including indoor grown peppers, tomatoes, chilies and herbs. And their Houseplant Defender Spray is perfect for tackling pests like aphids and spider mite and also helps control powdery mildew and it's pesticide free. Ecofective's products are available online at selected garden centres and home-based stores across the UK. Find out more and locate your nearest stockist at ecofective.uk.com. That's ecofective.uk.com. This is going to be a relatively short section because there aren't that many cultivars of the strawberry saxophage to collect as far as I know. I'm working off a list that I found on the Saxophage Society website which lists a 
about 12 cultivars. Now, bearing in mind, having looked at all of these, there are many that seem to be almost impossible to get your hands on and only a few of them are commonly available. But it does seem like there might be uh, more certainly than I have in my collection that I might be able to eventually source. I guess part of the reason why is that this plant just hasn't been very popular as a house plant or indeed as a garden plant over the last few years, although obviously on the ledge is hoping to change that. And this plant did virtually disappear off the house plant world's radar for, for quite a few years until the last few years when it does seem to be becoming more and more popular. So the two I have, I've already mentioned Stolonifera tricolor and the Maroon Beauty. I also mentioned that I had a kinky purple, which I unfortunately lost to slugs. Now, you want be, may be wondering about the name, kinky spelt K-I-N-K-I. -I. Now, this plant was collected by the well-regarded plant hunters, Bledin and Sue Wynne-Jones, who run a nursery in Wales called Krug Farm, famous for their rare and exotic plants, for mainly for gardens. And they collected this particular cultivar from Honshu in Japan in 1997 on the Kinky Peninsula, which explains the name. It's not anything to do with the leaves being kinky, it's just named after the place it was found. On the Krug Farm website, Kinky Purple is described as having conspicuous, rounded, intricately veined purple green leaves, creating a dense evergreen carpet of overlapping, softly hairy foliage affording glimpses of the red purple undersides. I'm looking forward to getting my hands on one of these again so I can actually make a really good comparison between Maroon Beauty and Kinky Purple and see what the differences are because I can't quite tell. I'm sure once I've got the two plants in front of me I will be able to see how they're different. Krug Farm also has a cultivar called Hime, H-I-M-E, that I haven't seen or grown, but this is supposed to be a very compact cultivar, and I'd love to get my hands on that one too. I can feel a, a Krug Farm order coming on, in fact. And the interesting thing about that is strawberry saxifrage isn't that big in the first place, so I guess, I'm guessing that Hime must be really, really tiny. And the other cultivar that I would love to see is one called, and I can't really pronounce this correctly, I suspect, Shichihenge. S-H-I-C-H-I -I, and then Henge, which seems like one of those Atlantis plants that only exists on the net as photographs. But it, it's mainly, the leaves are mainly cream with a, a, some green uh, splashes on them. And it looks absolutely amazing. I'd love to get hold of that one, but it does seem to be only available in Japan and the surrounding countries. The other one that does seem occasionally available is called and again, this is slightly hard to pronounce, Histu Silver, H-S-I-T-O-U Silver, which has extra silvery leaves, and that one sounds special too. So as you can tell, I've got quite a few strawberry saxophages to be adding to my collection. So there may be some intensive net searches going on in an effort to track down these plants. I also wanted to tell you one other fascinating thing I discovered about the strawberry saxifrage, and that's that in Japan, where this plant is a native, it's actually eaten as an edible. I found a really interesting LA Times blog, which explains that the Japanese name for this plant as an edible is Yuki no Shita, which translates as under the snow. And apparently in Japan, the leaves are eaten raw or cooked in dishes such as tempura, which is fascinating. And indeed, it is listed on the Plants for a Future website as an edible. I'll put a link to that in my show notes. As I say, I haven't tried eating it, so I'm not vouching for its tastiness, but it does appear that it's not at least going to poison you. But it does appear that it's at least a non-toxic plant that you could eat if you chose to. And if any Japanese listeners out there can give me a bit more information about how this plant is consumed, I would love to hear about it because I'm always fascinated by edible house plants. As I've mentioned before, Oxalis triangularis, the purple shamrock, it has lovely lemony flavoured leaves. But there aren't many edible plants uh, in the house plant range, so it's good to hear of this one. But don't worry too much about all these cultivars, because actually the species, strawberry saxophage, is really, really beautiful and a plant well worth having. So if you see a friend with one of these plants, then do beg a baby plant. And within weeks, you'll end up with your own set of strawberry saxophage babies. That's how generous this plant is.
And now it's time for question of the week, which comes from Chris, who asks about the Zamiococcus zamiofolia cultivar raven. Chris wants to know, given its dark foliage, do you know whether this plant requires more or less light than the green variety? Or is their care exactly the same? And he adds, on the plant's label and elsewhere, I've seen it called Dowton, D-O-W-T-O-N. I wondered if this is its official variety name and Raven a more commercially viable one. Great question, Chris. Um, I loved researching this one. It's a really interesting story. I got in touch with Costa Farms, who won the best new plant at the 2018 Tropical Plant Industry Exhibition in Florida for their for Raven. Um, so they know about this plant very well. I asked Justin Hancock from Costa Farms to comment on this and he came back with the following. We've found no difference in lighting preferences between Raven and traditional Zamiococcus. It tolerates equally low light. We've also found no appreciable differences in its watering needs. Culturally, it's no different than the species. So if a consumer can grow the species successfully, they shouldn't have any different experience with Raven other than its slower growth rate and the way the foliage changes color as it matures. So that's interesting. Uh, the point about the color changing foliage is very true. Lots of people do worry when they get this plant because the new foliage comes out and it is pale and interesting as opposed to dark and mysterious. But the foliage does darken with age as the leaf grows more mature so the anthocyanins kick in or whichever particular pigment it is that's providing the purple black element to the leaf that kicks in and the leaf goes dark. He also mentioned slower growth rate. I wanted to dig a bit further into this plant because Chris also raised the issue of the name Doughton. And so I managed to find the original patent for this plant. There's a US patent application for this plant, although interestingly, the plant is given the name Dowon, D-O-W-O-N. Now I know that I've seen it often described on various websites in the UK and in the US as having the official name Dowton, D-O-W-T-O-N, but the patent that clearly lists it as D-O-W-O-N. So I'm not sure how the extra T has slipped in there. Certainly the RHS listing for this plant has it as Dow on and I'm going to go by the patent because that is the original kind of source information. In a way, it's immaterial because this plant, as Chris has indicated, is marketed as Raven. This often happens where there's a kind of an official plant breeder's name and then there's a commercial name given to the plant. You often get it with things like the Rose Harlow car has the official breeder's name, Ouse House. They all seem to start with Ouse for some reason. So you get these different names that uh, are used in the trade as opposed to the commercial name. But the patent is also interesting for another reason because it does give a very detailed description of the plant and its background and it tells us that this new variety named Dowon was discovered in 2006 by the inventor at the Inventors Nursery at Sigokdong, Seoul, South Korea and the person who submitted the patent is called Hyuk Jin Lee and the patent notes that the inventor observed that a single plant of a typically green foliage Zamiococcus had produced on one of its compound leaves a set of leaflets with uncharacteristically very dark green color Coloration, tending to darken further as the leaflets expanded. When fully expanded, the leaflets, rachis and petiole became entirely black or near black. Zamiococcus may be propagated from individual leaflet cuttings. The inventor continued to observe the original plant for many months before carrying out the first asexual propagation in 2006 using black leaflets. And indeed, those black leaflets rooted and the plant that we know and love resulted from that propagation. It adds, the inventor has determined that Dawon reproduces true to type in successive generations of asexual reproduction via leaflet cuttings. So this is an example where a sport has emerged from regular plant production. This plant has randomly thrown out these dark green leaves and the person at the nursery then took the ball and run with it and made new plants out of it. The only real difference between the species and this cultivar appears to be that it's just slower growing, as is noted in the patent. That one may also be compared with the species Zamiococcus zamifolia by the rate of growth of new leaves arising from a rooted leaf cutting. 
The inventor has observed that a mature 60 centimetres height, fully black plant of Dawon may take seven to eight months to produce compared to with three to four months for production of green Zamiococcus zamiofolia. So there you go. The plant is significantly slower growing. And Chris, that really is the only difference between the species and the cultivar that you're likely to experience. It does look like you can put it in exactly the same conditions and it will do just as well. Do bear in mind that this plant does have a PBR on it. Plant breeder's rights means that although you can propagate this plant for your own personal use, you can't propagate it to sell. So that's just worth bearing in mind if you happen to be propagating lots of raven right now. So Dowon, Dowton or Raven, whatever you like to call it, it's a wonderful plant and it is becoming more widely available now. So if you can get your hands on one, then do give it a go because I think it's gorgeous. And if you've got a question for On The Ledge, drop me a line to ontheledgepodcast at gmail.com. Thanks to John and Fala for becoming Patreons this week. If you'd like to find out how, visit my show notes at janeperone.com. And the first transcript has now gone up for my spider plant episode. Do go and take a look and at how that works on the page and tell me what you think. Is it useful? Is it easy to access? I would love to hear from you if transcripts are important to you. And I'll be adding transcripts for shows going forward, as I've already said. And in more exciting news, from September, I'm going to be offering my Patreon subscribers of $5 a month or more a chance to listen to an ad-free version of the podcast. So if you're a legend or one of my On The Ledge super fans paying $5 or $10 a month, you can listen to the show ad-free. So that'll start on September the 6th because I'm taking a break from the show for three weeks from August the 16th to August the 30th so that I can recharge my batteries. So from September onwards, that ad-free version will be available on the Patreon feed. Whenever there is an episode with ads in it, just head on over to Patreon to hear the ad-free version. That's about wraps things up for this week. You now have my permission to go out and search desperately for strawberry saxifrages in your area and beyond. And maybe if you've got some plants that you want to share with fellow members of On The Ledge, do list them on the Houseplant Fans of On The Ledge Facebook group, which is the most friendly houseplant group in the universe. Do come and join us and share your plants. Have a great week. Bye. you heard in this week's episode was Roll Jordan Roll by the Joy Drops and Overthrown by Josh Woodward with advertising music by the Heftone Banjo Orchestra with the track Whistling Rufus. <laughs> <laughs>